Meeting start at nine oh eight second. Okay, members, uh, you're all very welcome to our council meeting here in the town hall, Tuesday, 5th of December. First of all, can I take any apologies? Hmm? John. Uh, Councillor Elaine Groff, Councillor Stephen McCann, and Councillor David Coyle may, may be here, but we don't think so. Okay, thanks, John. Stephen? Uh, Councillor Roof will be a little bit late. There was an accident on the road that he was travelling on. Okay, thanks, Stephen. And Paul? Councillor Elliot will be joining us later, hopefully. Okay, no other apologies? No? Okay, that's grand. So we're going to um, confirm and sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of November. So, first of all, for accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17, 18, and 19. Can I have a proposer? Uh, Earl, cheers, thank you. And a seconder, Declan, thank you. Okay, we're going to go to Matters Arising, page one. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, any declarations of interest? No. Okay, so matters arising, page one, two, three. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just uh, responding to the letter again to the Department of Health for the Women's Services in Listenerski. We asked a question about whether that decision was based on any rural impact assessment and while well, I note the response yet again, and I've read it numerous times, they haven't actually answered that question. So I'd like to ask again, was any rural assessment or any rural assessment impact done at all? And for them to answer it, you know, if they could, please. Thank you. Okay, you're making a proposal, Nolene. Thank you. And have a seconder. Uh, Josephine, thank you. All agreed? Okay. Anything else on two? Three? Four? Um, just on page four, Chair, um, the correspondence received from DFI, this is in relation to signage at schools. And the council had inquired if signage at private childcare facilities uh, was provided for within the department's proposals. Uh, and the department has advised that, that they are not, uh, though there are other signs that may be available and email contact details have been provided uh, if members wish to make direct representations on that chair. Okay, thanks, Alison. <clears throat> and David? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alison. Um, we, we read the letter there in the in the minutes. Um, there seems a bit of confusion, possibly around this preschool. Uh, the preschool itself, you have to go through the EA administration for admissions to get into the preschool. Um, it's got a Department of Education number of the preschool. So I'm not entirely sure if it's fully private or part private or what that is. So I was wondering if we could possibly write back to them again and give them the name of the school, Irvinstown Cross Community. Uh, preschool and 
ask them to clarify if it is private or not private, but it seems r ridiculous to me why they would be withholding, putting up safety signs for, for children at a school. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous in my point of view. So I propose that we write to them again and give them the name of the preschool and get them to confirm that it is, in my view, not private and should get signed as others. Thanks, David. Diana? Chair, thank you. Yes, and, and I would concur with uh, Councillor Mahan. I was going to ask, is a private childcare facility the same as, or is it different than a community childcare facility? Um, I had asked, I had had a site meeting on this topic with at this location and was assured that the sign would be provided and we are still waiting. The, this, the play group still waiting for that sign. Now it wouldn't be this, it wouldn't be, as I said, a road safety sign. It would have been an alternative for that to, to indicate yeah. to slow down, but still hasn't happened. So just express disappointment um, that it's taking so long to get that sign. But I'd uh, second uh, Councillor Mahan's proposal. Thank you. That's grand. Uh, are we all agreed, members? Yeah, uh, this is reminiscent of uh, myself trying to look for one uh, in for New to Butler Cross Community Play School, and they wouldn't they wouldn't do anything there either. You know that was a good few years ago. So it'd be a uh, it'd be interesting to see if we can just define what now is because you have to go through EA to get registered and all the rest. So, yep. Okay. Anything else on four? Five. Thanks, Chair. Just on page five, um, there's two items. Firstly, in relation to DERA and Forest Service, uh, we had, there was an outstanding query from the informal uh, meeting with Forest Service. So in response, Chair, the Forest Service staff advised the total number of Forest Service staff uh, headquartered at Inneskeen House, Inneskillen, is approximately 95 at October 2023. But you'll see from the um, correspondence that we had also made a formal FOI request, which essentially asked for the full breakdown, which is my understanding of what members uh, had previously requested from Forest Service. So that's being progressed now as an FOI, and we'll report the findings of that when, when we receive them. Okay, thanks, Alison. Barry? I, I'm at uh, Neil Gibson's correspondence. I'm uh, too early. I can we'll come to that later. We'll opt out yeah, for now. I didn't get that. Sorry, Sorry Chair, I was just going to suggest if we got maybe Councillor McAdoff proposer and seconder for the DERA position first, yeah. and then we can move straight on to Neil Gibson. Yeah, okay, happy to propose. Okay, thank you. And a seconder, Bernard, thank you. I Just when I'm thinking of this, do I need proposers and seconders for the previous two? Yeah, I think Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Okay. So yes, Chair, the second item then is the correspondence from Neil Gibson, the Permanent Secretary in the Department of Finance. Uh, and this was regarding the publicity of the Connect2 hubs, but also the availability of the hubs for uh, cross-border bodies. And uh, some clarity is provided by the Permanent Secretary in relation to those queries. Okay, yeah, Barry. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, again, yes, some clarity has been provided, but I think we could do with more. Um, I know that... Uh, in the Skillen town based councillors and in the Skillen councillors will want to comment on the first part of the letter but my my focus is on um maximizing the take up of the existing oma connect 2 hub it's a, a great facility to have and in the letter from neil gibson he says that other public sector organizations can discuss the use of the connect 2 hubs with their sponsoring departments and a number of non-departmental public bodies are already making use of the existing hubs. I think if we could carry out our own desk exercise, perhaps, uh, what are those non-departmental public bodies, NDPBs, who might wish to avail of a service like that that is in place in OMA, and that we would play our part in highlighting to them the availability of such a thing? Because whenever they say there's 39 users per month, would like to drive that upwards because uh, it's a wonderful facility to have and there probably should be some engagement with Mr McDonnell who is referred to there uh, if we have any further queries uh, so I just like to ratchet up a little bit our interest in making that connect to hub flourish flourish in OMA uh, and I'll leave it at that for now thank you chair 
Chair, may, may I, and maybe if Councillor McIldoff was so minded, as well as the desktop review that we could undertake, um, and mindful it can sometimes be hard to get data, if we were to write to each of the permanent secretaries who have arm's length bodies to clarify the scope composition of those, whether or not the Connect2 hub availability, particularly in OMA, has been highlighted to them. Uh, and then we could certainly supplement that with our own research. Yep. Thanks very much for that assistance, Chief Executive. And through the Chair, I would propose accordingly. Thank you. OK. Thanks, Barry. Uh, Jeremy? Thanks, Chair. Uh, just to comment on the, the confirmation there that the uh, Inniskillen Civil Service Hub is, is not going ahead as, uh, at the minute due to budget cuts, as it says, uh, you know, another casualty of our very lacklustre budgets coming from Westminster. Um, you know, the general idea of, of the hub is okay. You know, at the minute there's staff working hybrid, so the demand may not be as, as it was, but the, the general idea of the hubs is to move civil servants out of Belfast and to make those jobs accessible to people from rural areas. That's still an admirable policy, and we still should pursue that. So, you know, hopefully that we can we can look at this in the long term. You know, that's something that we do need. You know, for people especially who cannot work from home or who do not want to work from home, you know, a hub is a valuable asset that could be used for them. So that's it, Chair. Thank you. Are you happy enough to second, Dermot? Yeah. Thank you. Barry's proposal. And did I get the... Um... It is. It makes second. It doesn't. He. Uh, he can do. You. You happy to second the note as well? Thanks, Chairman. Okay. Uh, sorry that. So it's been proposed and seconded there. Uh, the proposal by Barry. Are we all agreed? Okay. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd like to make a further proposal. Um. It's not with regard to Enniskillen and the budgetary pressures that, that um, Dermot has alluded to there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have some very good workspaces in Fermanagh. So I'm, I would propose that um, the department may wish to explore um, using the workhouse as a connect to hub or indeed the business centre. We have a couple of um, options there. So I'd like to put that as a proposal to them in face of the budgetary pressures that they're, they're encountering. Thanks, Chair. Would that be incorporated into the same letter, or would you want to do it separately, incorporated in? And I'm sure young Barry and Dermot are happy enough to incorporate. Thank you, members there. Okay, and Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh, I was going to obviously come to the and support uh, Councillor McAdoss' proposal there, but. Uh, with regard to Councillor Armstrong's as well, I'm happy to happy to support the inner skill side of the, the issue as well. So it's been proposed and seconded both, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, yeah. Chair. Okay, we're all agreed there, members, so thank you. Okay, anything else on four? Just at the bottom there, Chair, sorry, page five is the letter from DFI, and this is in relation to the Council's representations about flood prevent, sorry, prevention uh, measures in Fermanagh and Oma. And there was a particular concern expressed at the last meeting about the maybe deprioritization of some of the flood proposals for Oma. So an update's provided on the business case and the, the feasibility study, which is due for completion early next year. Um, some details are provided uh, regarding the broad principles around community resilience and noted that our own officer can provide further information and then uh, I suppose a, a wider renewed focus on flood prevention measures. I think maybe Chair, there might be some confusion in the letter regarding the geography, because I think that's the references for Straban and Castle Derg, which wouldn't generally be considered as part of the OMA flood modelling. Um, it would be more the upstream works that would be considered. Um, just to know, Chair, we also have scheduled a briefing as requested for members with our own emergency planning officer, and that's on Monday the 18th, virtual, Monday the 18th of December at 2pm. Errol? Yeah, thank you again, Chair, and thanks to our Chief Executive for that report. Uh, I suppose this is to be welcomed from, uh, again, from Dr McMahon with regard to this uh, 
and it's keeping it it's keeping it highlighted. Uh, I know Alison has referred to Castle Derrick and what have you. I suppose it's maybe they're looking at it as probably a West Tyrone constituency matter as well. But uh, certainly with the things in Oma Town that have been mentioned in this report, uh, I think it's good to be able to keep it uh, on the radar, so to speak. So uh, I, I welcome the report. I'm happy to propose the, the noting of the report at the stage, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Josephine. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alison, for your report. And I'm happy to second the noting of this correspondence. Um, you know, on the face of it, um, this response seems to be reassuring. But, you know, we, we, we have seen recent events uh, throughout the North and the devastating impact of flooding on communities and uh, there's no doubt that uh, with climate change we are going to see more and more severe uh, weather events and OMA in particular and other areas throughout the district but OMA in particular is a town that is well noted for its flooding and uh, you know I think that there, that there needs to be a very significant investment in measures which are designed to prevent flooding uh, going forward. Uh, given uh, that Oma is a town of second largest population in the west of the province, and given its history, and in recent years, given many near misses, uh, where uh, um, uh, bridges were almost uh, uh, breached, um, certainly the measures that are described in this uh, document are to be welcomed um, and I note the community uh, resilience group and uh, you know the the um, implication that it's up to every citizen uh, to ensure that they have adequate protection in place to protect their properties but uh, and I'm conscious of budgetary constraints mm -hmm. but I really feel that OMA needs to be kept very high on the list of priorities because once flooding happens it will be too late at that point, as we have seen in places like Nine Patrick. So we don't want a repeat of that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Josephine. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I welcome the fact that this correspondence does seem to confirm that we should hopefully have some clarity around the, the outcome uh, of this review uh, in early 2024. And hopefully at that stage, we'll be able to have some idea of what we are working with. But I do have some concern that a significant element of the language in this correspondence seems to be almost preparatory for the oncoming of bad news in the sense that there is a significant emphasis on the degree to which these things and these investments need to be directed by population numbers in particular. And I, look, I look in particular at this quote of, unfortunately, it is not feasible to provide a flood alleviation scheme in every area, which is prone to flooding, the department must direct funding to areas where they will have maximum impact, and in some areas, the cost of these proposals far outweigh any benefits in terms of flood alleviation that would be gained, even if the project was affordable. In the past, when OMA was being considered, quite often it was the case of feasibility and affordability, and it worries me that this is already being caveated by the fact that even if it potentially is considered affordable, that it still may not be considered viable or will not be up for consideration for being taken forward by the department. And in terms of the criteria which would be applied to any potential scheme to benefit OMA, I would urge the department to very generously consider existing degree of flood protection and special considerations given the degree of damage that there is real potential to be caused to our economy and to the livelihoods of our people not least exemplified by what has happened recently in Downpatrick and Nerving. And the final point that I would make, Chair, is that the emphasis on population numbers, to a large extent, I think is actually quite hypocritical, because if you consider the direction of economic policy, over the course of the last two decades, we have essentially had market distortion in that you have the vast majority of investment and opportunity being concentrated in the east of the province incentivizing people in the West to leave their homes and their communities. 
and thus reducing the ability for us to actually have the numbers to be able to justify what, in their view, would be sufficient to be able to justify this particular investment. So I think that that's hypocritical. I don't think that that should be the primary consideration. And if a viable option is identified as part of this study for OMA, then I think that very serious consideration needs to be given to taking that forward because it's necessary for the well-being of our people. Thanks, Stephen. Chairs? Thanks, Chair. Um, could the Chief Executive maybe uh, remind me on, was there a, a flood scheme um, issued there about a year or two years ago that, um, I don't know, maybe had a, a billion pound involved in it, of which uh, zero amount of it came to the Fermanagh and Oma council area. Um, am I right in that, or, or is that only my imagination? But uh, I'm, I'm nearly sure there was a flood scheme uh, where we were completely le left out of. Uh, Chair, I, my recollection, I don't remember the, the quantum of the scheme, but certainly there was a flood defence scheme which predominantly focused on East Belfast and some work in Uri. Um, and it was certainly in the hundreds of millions, would be my recollection. Uh, and yes, there, there was no provision uh, for the Fermanagh and Oma district as part of that. And in the context of the, the prioritisation criteria that were used at that time, um, from memory, that is when Uri slightly leapfrog, leapfrogged Oma in terms of the investment re sorry, requirement and also for the, uh, the, the need criteria, which would be assessed in terms of how floods, flood schemes would be used in the future. The, I suppose the other relevant point, and uh, while Councillor Green's referencing the capital, uh, members will remember, and I appreciate the scale of the flooding was different, but we have had CFA schemes in the past, and we've had instances in Fintna, Lisnesky, and other parts of the district where business premises have been adversely affected by flooding, and there was no government intervention to assist those premises. Okay, and um, Barry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome the fact that we're going to have our own internal uh, briefing on the 18th of December. Uh, I think that's a Monday, isn't it? Aye, that's, that's good. Um, I remember uh, attending meetings in Berra and Fintna in the past to help establish local community resilience groups. And I can't help but think that there's room for more. There's room for more because there is a kind of a an informal network, you know, waiting to respond in a community, you know, a bit like first responders. Um, so we just uh, think that it probably goes back to that period, 2013, 2015, when those localised meetings were taking place in response. Councillor Rennie was in attendance at the, the Bear and Fintna ones that I recall. And uh, so we just think that type of thing, we, we have a community and voluntary sector, sports clubs not least, who would be willing to play their part in, in community efforts in, in the event of flooding, but um, best practice, how to go about it, how to be most effective, uh, would be good training for everybody. So uh, I look forward to taking that up uh, at that meeting on the 18th of December. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Barry. Anything else on four? Five? Six? Or just in relation then to page six, there are a couple of items. Firstly, uh, item five nine, the windfall tax support for business. Just to note, it's in the correspondence folder, but a letter from the Treasury dated the 5th of uh, November. And this is in relation to the Council's previous representations regarding the windfall tax and how the needs of businesses could be supported. Um, so we do essentially just proposer and seconder for noting, please. And then there's one other item that I'll come on to. Okay. I have a proposer and a seconder. Paul proposing. Seconded Josephine. Thank you, members. Yeah, so the second item then, Chair, is item 510, and this is from the Department for Infrastructure. And this is the request on the budgetary uh, position and allocation. Now, to the best of my knowledge, Chair, we haven't as a council received this level of, of information before. And we've just taken a preliminary look, and the intention would be that we will do some further analysis uh, with a view to reporting to our Rural Affairs Subcommittee meeting in, in January. But if members were minded, 
I think it would be appropriate to ask the department, um, there's a note included on the spreadsheets which refers to need and how equitable distribution uh, across the divisions is, has been reached. So I think it would be appropriate for us to ask how the basis of need is defined, what indicators the department have used, and how they have been weighted in reaching the budgetary position. Um, and we should have a reasonably good analysis complete chair for the January meeting. Okay. Thanks, Alison. Can I have a proposal and seconder to note that? And then we'll follow it up in the new year. Stephen and Bernard, thank you. All agreed? Okay, moving on. Anything else on six, seven? Just page seven and a, a further letter from the Department for Infrastructure. This is just in relation to the A5 Western Transport Corridor and really the Permanent Secretary just confirming that it's ultimately now a matter for a minister or a senior civil servant uh, when they've considered all relevant documentation to determine the next stages in relation to the scheme. Okay, thanks, Alison. And can I have a proposal and second for the noting? Marty and Barry, thank you. Moving on on six, seven, eight. Yes, Chair, just on page eight, uh, it corresponds from the, the Department of Health, and this is in relation to the Attract, Recruit, Retain scheme. Uh, you remember we did a discussion about this at the last Council meeting, and it was agreed that the matter would be included on the subcommittee agenda, which we did. It wasn't something that the uh, SPPG were in a position to attend and discuss, so the background to the initiative is outlined within the um, the Permanent Secretary's correspondence, and we'll certainly re-extend the invitation to the next Health Subcommittee meeting for the SPPG. Okay, thanks, Alison. Barry? Yep. Just the, the ability to recruit essential health health care staff, health professionals. Uh, it's, it's, it's the news today that there is British government proposals to make it more difficult for people to come here and to contribute to our health service. Apparently, you're going to have to have a start in salary of, is it £38,000? And you're not going to be able to bring your family with you. So there's uh, obstacles been put in the way of uh, people being able to work here from other countries, other societies. And, uh, you know, with recently with the rise in racism, and uh, such things, uh, we're all the more aware now of the valuable contribution that people from other countries make to our health service. Somebody said that they were uh, jumped on by three foreign nationals and they helped them in three different ways in the hospital setting. You know, it was kind of a, a, a positive way to describe the role of people in our health service. So it's alarming news coming through uh, today that there will be additional barriers put in the way of people coming to work here from other countries in respect of our health service. So uh, maybe a bit of scoping out to be done uh, as to how we can effectively lobby on that matter. Uh, is that one where Heaton Harris is in our sightlines? Uh, you know, I'll leave it like that, Chair. Thank you. And would you note the uh, correspondence? Proposed to note. Thank you, Mary. Moving on to Josephine. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, well, I'll second the noting of the correspondence. Chair, unfortunately, a lot of, uh, you know, the the uh, attract, recruit and retain scheme um, proposals really <clears throat> do not help um, rural general practices to recruit GPs. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are fundamental issues uh, which deter young GPs from coming to rural areas. And uh, generally speaking, that will be the fact that for the most part, practices are small, uh, that they have um, a lot of patients per GP, uh, that uh, GPs coming to rural practices do not have the same opportunities uh, to avail of educational activities, of study leave, of annual leave, and um, Ultimately, uh, it means that they will tend to stay within larger uh, uh, 
more urban practices. Um, I think that whilst this scheme that uh, Mr May describes is, is definitely useful and has attracted uh, um, and has been successful in attracting uh, new GPs into practice, I think the fundamental problem for rural practices remain the same. And that's why we're seeing more and more pressure being bought, brought to bear on rural practices, many of which we have seen have handed back their contracts and have been taken over by the Western Trust. So um, I think we will have to uh, explore all of these issues in much more detail and find a tailor-made solution uh, to the crisis in GP recruitment uh, in our council area. Chair, thank you. Okay, thanks, Josephine. Eddie? Thanks, Chair. Um, just to echo uh, Councillor Dean's words there, um, in spite of this, this has started uh, the 4th of January this year. Um, we, we've seen fewer GP, um, uh, fewer uh, junior doctors uh, joining the GP training scheme than the, the previous year. So I'm not sure we can actually see true progress in the number of GPs that are, are being produced over that time. Um, as a point of clarity as well on Councillor McAdoff's uh, comment on, on the recruitment in healthcare and particularly um, international recruitment, it's my understanding that, that healthcare will be exempt in that. But equally, I, I don't support the decision, um, but, but there should hopefully be some form of protection in the healthcare sector, particularly in the care sector, which is really vital uh, that, that we maintain the level of international recruitment that we currently have. Otherwise, it would be a total crisis. Okay. Thanks, Eddie. Okay. Moving on. Anything else on eight? Nine? Ten? Ten. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in relation to the, on page 10, just to remind members, so this is the meeting with DFI Roads around the Enniskillen uh, Dublin Road turning. So that has been arranged, virtual meeting for Thursday and invitations have issued. Okay. And just at the, the bottom of that page, Chair, um, the letter from the Department for the Economy, and this is in relation to the Department's decision not to locate any of the consultation events for 10X within the district. And I suppose similar to a comment made by a member earlier, it doesn't really address the, the question directly uh, as to why the council was excluded. It just makes broad reference to why a couple of the other venues were selected. Okay, thanks, Alison. <clears throat> Have I a proposal seconder? Diana? I propose to note, but just if, if you would permit me, just to make comment on our meeting with Invest NI, just to say that it was a very positive meeting. And um, I know that they have offered further meetings, and I think that's a good thing that um, that we have the support within the council to do that to further engage on economic on matters of economic development. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, certainly I concur there, and I think we'll get a little bit of a brief uh, on that uh, meeting. But just to say initially that, as Diana says, it was a very positive meeting with Invest NI, which is. Uh, always one for the books to uh, uh, so hopefully the uh, the uh, way ahead seems to be a much more positive look towards for and Oma and uh, my hope is that we can build on that positivity and to be able to move forward I suppose uh, and I might ask Alison just to comment but my understanding unless I'm getting it wrong is that we were under the assumption that the um, investing in land by invest would be something that may be uh, passed on to councils, but I think we were reassured at the meeting that that wasn't the case and that invest would hold that uh, remit going forward and that they would um, look on a case by case basis, I suppose, as to where there was a failure of, of uh, not enough land and then at that point they would come in to uh, maybe uh, help stimulate the uh, the economy at that end, but maybe Alison would like to comment. No, I think I think that's a very fair assessment, Chair. Uh, firstly, the intention is sorry that we bring a, a report to next month's pol or sorry next week's policy and resources committee because I think it is linked in with the establishment of the economic development uh, working group, and indeed reference is made in in the uh, DFE letter to the place based approach and place based strategy. But yes, um, the Lions review had made 
certainly a number of recommendations and my understanding from those was that it was likely that Invest and I would no longer have a role in terms of industrial land, uh, but certainly based on the meeting last week, they indicated that where there was evidence of need and market failure, uh, that they would certainly explore that proactively. And they did identify uh, the district as one of the locations that they were likely to, would be likely to have an interest in. So I, I will include that in the general summary chair and uh, we can take the work from there. Yeah. Okay, Seamus. Thanks, Chair. And I'm glad that um, the impression is that they are making more of an effort. But as, um, as a, unfortunately, I have seen in the past, um, they always do talk uh, a positive talk, as in what they're going to do west of the ban. And unfortunately, their actions then let them down. It's back in 2013, uh, as far as I remember, uh, when um, Arlene Foster was the Minister of Economy, when I first uh, asked for a breakdown of the expenditure and help that businesses were getting in Fermanagh and Oma. And uh, from the top of my head, I think uh, it was... In Fermanagh and Oma, it was the equivalent of 33p per person per capita, whereas in Belfast, it was £2.50 per person per capita. It worked out for Mana, I think it was something like between 10 and 15 million was getting. Um, Belfast, it was £650 million uh, pound wasn't being invested. Uh, every county was, or every uh, uh, Every area, council area, was by far higher than, than this area. Uh, then when the review was being done there uh, a year or two ago by Invest NI, uh, the exact same thing was happening, even though there was assurances given at the time that it would be remedied and that they'd do their best to uh, bring more, more investment into the Fermanagh Noma area. It didn't happen. Uh, and again, we're at the stage where we're getting these promises again. And unfortunately, uh, I'll not be about uh, in 10 years' time uh, in this chamber, chamber, I would suspect, but whoever is sitting in this seat, if they ask the same question, I would suspect that it'll be the same answer. It'll be uh, we are getting the, the crumbs of the table. Uh. Hopefully, hopefully we'll take it in a positive light. Will you second the noting of the uh, 10x? Thank you. And Barry, I'm not, I'm not really opening this on a on a whole discussion on the invest. It's going to come to PNR. So, um, Barry, if it's on that, it needs to be brief. Okay, very brief. Just as it restate a priority, an absolute priority for our council, is to have industrial land available in Oma, and there's two contextual things that are happening at the same time the a5 hopefully we're going to get this green light for the a5 sooner rather than later easy access to the a5 and also in the context of the local policies plan in early 2024 we need to be identifying land which is suitable for industrial development uh, in oma at this time i'll leave it at that thank you chair that's good thanks very okay uh, that correspondence has been proposed and seconded, so we're going to move on. Page 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to point five now to consider a report on environmental services committee meeting held on the 8th of November. Okay, so first of all, for accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. 
In the absence of the chair, could I have another member propose? Paul, thank you. And Nolene seconding, thank you. Okay, matters arising. Page one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Thank you. It was indeed. Just on page six, um, the basic question, is there any update? Are we any closer on establishing the source of the noise, Noma? That's my question. And, you know, ask the director to advise what is involved in the exercise to track the source of this noise, because it's very serious. People are losing sleep. Um, people are wondering, is it agricultural thrasher and source, but it wouldn't be going at 11 o'clock at night. So okay. what is the procedure for getting to the bottom of this? Okay. Are we any closer? All right, thanks, Barry. And Alex? I think we have advised members already on this on a number of occasions. So an investigation is underway. When that investigation, it would be inappropriate for us to talk about potential sources at this stage. It would prejudice the investigation and may prejudice ongoing proceedings. So when that is fully concluded, we'll be updating members accordingly. Okay. Thank you, members. We're moving along. Uh, we're moving to item number seven to consider a report from Re Regeneration and Community Committee. And that was on the 14th of November. So uh, Mark is the chair there. And we're taken for accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And Mark? Happy to propose the minutes of RNC chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And Diana is seconding. Okay. And we are going to move to accuracy or to matters rising, I mean, uh, page one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, and ten. Thank you. Moving on to consider report of policy and resources committee meeting held on the fifteenth of November. And for accuracy, page one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. In the absence of the chair, can I have another member, Josephine? And seconded, Rashin, thank you. Wasn't there? Anne Marie second. Thank you. And for matters arising, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Sorry, Chair, just on page seven, item six four one which is the National Association of Councillors Northern Ireland Region. They're developing a new economy workshops. Uh, two were identified in both in January, one in the McGee campus in Derry, London Derry, the other in the new campus uh, in Belfast, new Ulster campus in Belfast. And it was agreed that we would also include this on the agenda for consideration this evening. Okay. <clears throat> Earl. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks for, to Alison for that. Uh, just with regard to NEC, it was brought up at our last meeting of the NEC, so uh, I'd already spoken to our chief executive on it, and, and she told me it was coming up this evening again. 
So uh, I wish to put my name forward for the event in the uh, McGee campus in Londonderry on the 26th of January. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Chair. And have you a seconder? Paul? Thank you. Any other expressions of interest? John? Can I propose a councillor by Adolf to the day? Okay, uh, we have a seconder there. Marty, thank you. Okay, no other indications? Are we all agreed there, members, that those two councillors attend? Okay, thank you. Anything else on seven? Yet? Victor? Sorry, Chair. I had proposed um, Councillor, uh, Councillor Armstrong for that. Just she wasn't mentioned there, but she was, I see it noted on the on the minutes. She's um, already included, Victor. But, but uh, she just wanted to go to the one. It was my mistake. I thought there were two different two different uh, events, but just uh, just happy enough to go with the one. Yeah. Earl? Chair, just to clarify, it's the same event, but just two different locations, one each side of the country. That's what it is. Yeah, no, that's all good. Yeah. Diana, would you like to clarify which venue you're? Yes, I, I think I had asked to go to the one in London Dairy. Thank you, Chair. Okay, cheers, thank you. Barry? Just to assure you, Chair, we're all going to the same destination. We might be using different names, but we're going through Straban, some of us. <laughs> uh, I, I thank you for that clarification. Uh, okay, so we have... Uh, where were we there? Page eight, page seven, eight and nine. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go now uh, to item 10 and 10 one is the nominations to attend the National Association of Council. No, we've done that there, that one we've just done. So uh, point 11 then to consider delegation of council powers to the following committee, policy and resources committee to consider a report on draft responses on consultation on the reintroduction of hospital uh, parking charges, Department of Health. Just propose it, yeah. Uh, Robert, thanks. And Victor, seconding? Okay. And then go to point 12. So to receive an update on proposal from recommendation for from PNR committee regarding the potential to waive a car parking charges in the council owned off street car parks on the 9th, 16th and 23rd of December. And I'll ask Alison. Okay, Chair, thank you. So in the report members, we were asked at the last meeting to, to provide uh, some information uh, on, on the comparable dates last, sorry, the same dates uh, last December. So the three Saturdays in question uh, were are listed and they would be the 3rd, 10th and 17th of December 2022. Uh, we've set out within the report the number of car parks the council owns, which is 15, uh, the number of spaces, the income received in terms of parking fees on the dates in question, the occupancy rates and the income received then in relation to uh, fixed penalty notices. Um, we set out then, Chair, the enforcement requirements uh, which irrespective of whether or not the council chooses to proceed either with waiving or uh, reduced parking, we would still need to continue and the costs associated with that. Uh, there had been some commentary uh, regarding other councils and we have engaged uh, with other councils that have offered varying approaches in terms of uh, free of charge facilities or uh, in terms of uh, reduced facilities. The feedback has generally been quite negative uh, in terms of the potential for space blocking and also for, I suppose, all day parking. Um, and one neighbouring council, in fact, 
is working on the basis of a reduced tariff, uh, which prevents perhaps that, that same risk. Um, just making reference then to, a specific reference was made to Armagh, City, Banbridge and Craigavon, and I suppose just noting the, the very significant out-of-town shopping offerings uh, some distance from both Borstown and Banbridge, uh, which were the, the precursor uh, for that particular intervention. Set out a paragraph 27, Chair, the Council's previous deliberations on this matter, and then just summarising that the implementation of free car parking in Omen and Eskillen uh, would cost the Council up to £30,000 in lost income and unavoidable uh, enforcement costs. Uh, our indications would be it's generally viewed as counterproductive intervention to support local businesses at a time uh, when car parking is generally at a premium and businesses want to encourage a churn of spaces. Um, in previous years and following engagement with various representative business organisations, the focus has been on festive music and the entertainment programme. It's been well received, uh, but certainly I imagine it's something that could be enhanced and there's certainly no evidence that we would have that free car parking would, would enhance the overall offering. However, recognise that, that members may have a different view on that. And it would be suggested, Chair, that should members wish to more fully assess the feasibility of free parking or reduced tariff parking proposals, it would be suggested that we are afforded the opportunity to properly identify and research those options. This would allow consultation with local businesses and traders to be undertaken and for costed proposals to be brought forward to you, which would then take a realistic account uh, of a time frame for implementation. And just coincidentally, Chair, I had a scheduled meeting earlier this evening uh, with, with business representatives from Enniskillen, and certainly their feedback was one of concern in terms of the impact that free parking would have. And their views certainly would be, while there might be models that could be worked through, uh, they would not at this stage be reckoning, recommending a free car parking proposal. Okay. Thanks, Alison. Mark? You, Chair. Um, I mean, firstly, I don't even know where to begin with this. It was three weeks ago, almost exactly three weeks ago to the day that I first requested this report. And yet, what limited information we now have tonight only came through earlier today. So even if we had questions on the back of the information we've received, we wouldn't have had time to ask information to ask further questions. And the Chief Executive will, will know and will remember that I emailed her, I think it was the 15th of November, and asked her for very short, brief factual information. Very, very short factual information. And it still took two and a half weeks for that response to come through. So I mean, Chair, I have big, big concerns to how we got to this stage. And I mean, nevertheless, having taken three weeks to prepare the report that we've got tonight, I mean, looking at it, I would have expected an awful lot more than what we've got. I would have expected an options paper with options A, B, C, D, E, and F and G, but instead we haven't. We've got one paper that doesn't provide the information or any option at all. It's simply a negative, no, it can't be done, and this is why it can't be done. And again, it's such a totally one-sided document. There's no, there's no genuine consideration of the facts. It's selective in the picture it's trying to paint and whilst i appreciate the chief executive has said she has spoken to councils and they're concerned i equally have spoken to members of other councils and they present a totally different picture so it's not the one-sided um image that some in the council are trying to present no one was talking about no enforcement i never said anything about no enforcement no one is talking about um encouraging all-day parking i mean one of the options i would have liked and would have expected to be included in tonight's document was for instance, an option that had maybe a two -hour, maximum two hour stay or a three hour stay. And once that point, or once you pass that point, then suddenly fees kick in. That would, that would remove the, the concern of all day parking. And absolutely, that's a concern I would have shared. But again, I make the point that that's an option I would have expected to be on the table and for us to be considering tonight. And again, this paper is just pained in the worst case scenario. And it's trying to push us down a certain route. There's nothing genuine or there's nothing reasonable within the paper that we're considering tonight. And Chair, I mean, the longer I'm on this council, I've, and I've been on the council six months now, and I don't mean this by a general sweeping statement, but I am increasingly losing confidence in the advice and the information that we as members are receiving. Because ultimately, and I feel like I make this point month after month, ultimately it is for the council members, 40 of us, to make the decisions. Yes, ask information and receive advice, but we are the decision makers. But yet, 
constantly, and tonight's just another example of that, where information was asked for, options would have been expected, and no option has been prepared, and we're, and we're being pushed down this route. I mean, okay. Chair. I think you're, you're repeating the, the point here, Mark. But, but Chair, so I make, I make the point, this council, and I'm absolutely convinced of this, we were misinformed, badly misinformed over the Halloween fireworks, and the Chief Executive will know exactly what I'm talking about in relation to that. And tonight, I appreciate there's no point talking about free car parking from Saturday because we haven't got a genuine options paper. So I don't propose, or I don't intend to push this to a proposal tonight. But again, it's to express A, the frustration, and B, the actual disappointment that once again, as 40 decision makers, or meant to be 40 decision makers, we haven't been given the opportunity. And that's a problem. That's a big, big problem, Chair. Okay. Alison, do you want to... Well, no, just I suppose a couple of general comments, Chair. Firstly, if if, if the member had required or wished an options paper, I'd respectfully suggest that should have been the proposal. Uh, what we were asked was to provide the financial implications of offering free car parking to the council on specific weekends. We did that. Uh, in terms of the options appraisal, if that was and the nuancing which the member is introducing, which I think is reasonable and is why it would come as presumably a reasoned proposal from the floor. If the member has any concerns about my advice, there are channels which he can pursue that. And I would suggest it's not in an open forum such as this chair, but I certainly stand over the advice I've provided. And the recommendation before you is the one that you have adopted. It references nothing around options or beyond that. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Um, I don't know where to start after, after that. Um, I have to say, maybe it's, I'll, I'll give uh, a pardon uh, uh, to Councillor Ovens that maybe he doesn't know what way the council works or that, but uh, to come up with a proposal two, three weeks ago in the mouth of Christmas and then uh, to ask for a specific thing because I was there on the night that it was asked and the chief executive has got it right, it was to bring back uh, the cost of doing it and then to um, lay into the chief executive and the officers uh, for doing exactly what he asked defies belief. Um, so uh, I, I'm not so sure where, where he's coming for, from on that. I would suggest uh, if he was serious about it, he should have made this proposal three months ago and, and specifically asked for, uh, uh, for what he was asking for there earlier. But to ask for something and then go into a rant after it's provided, and it took two and a half weeks to do it, I think that's not too bad. When else could it have been put before the council? Only now. Like, uh, did he expect a special council meeting for himself to come in so that uh, okay. it could be presented to him before tonight? Because this was the only opportunity it could have been presented. So I, I don't know. Um, he seems to be uh, taking the, the role of the three independents who uh, who uh, we all remember, or any of us who was here the last time, uh, was very disruptive and, and kept continuously bringing these type of proposals to the, to the council. I would suggest that all the, or the vast majority of businesses, as this isn't a new proposal, this has been discussed before in council, uh, on uh, previous mandates and at every stage uh, the businesses wanted traffic flowing and I must say as a, a shopper around Christmas when I go into Enniskillen uh, the one thing that put me off of is if I couldn't get a car parking place where they were all filled up with cars sitting for hours upon hours so uh, but the one suggestion I would make, make uh, here is that the likes of Lissenski and Brooper and Irvinstown, Balik, and all, I think, is all free parking. And uh, I would, I would uh, encourage our constituents to to uh, uh, avail of the brilliant shops that's in them towns and villages as well. And the likes of Drumore, Garrick Moore, uh, Fintna. So um, that'd be what I'd say. But I, I uh, propose to note the report. And I'm sure it was an oversight, Seamus, on your uh, mind there that you left Newton Butler out. But uh, overlooking that point, I'm going to move on to John Finley. Uh, I'll be here all night. I have to name out all the towns. So I'm not <laughs> going to start. Uh, I'm happy to second the proposal. I'm happy that the estimates process has started. Uh, we'll all be happy to discuss this further. 
And um, but like I say, I wasn't here for the last four years, but the four years before, we, we talked plenty on this too. And it seems to be a pretty strong consensus that the businesses don't want it, and a lot of a lot of the shoppers don't want it too. Because I've had the misfortune of having to call the Liskillen on Christmas Eve, and it is a total nightmare. You're, you're parked from the minute you hit the town boundary. But then you can't get parked when you do get in, you know, so you have to keep a bit of a flow. So thank Are you. Are you willing to note, John, the correspondence? And I have a seconder to note. Seconder, Shane's proposals. Uh, okay. Okay. We're moving on then, members. And correspondence then. So. Chair, item 13 one has been dealt with, so we're on to item 13 two. Yep. Um, so this is correspondence from Derry City and Straban District Council. There's really two elements to it, Chair. The first is the really to note uh, a recently adopted motion through Derry City and Straban, which I know similar motions have been in other councils with um, a proximity to Loch Ness. But I suppose the second part then is the willingness to attend a meeting regarding the, the legal status really of, of rights of nature. I have sought clarity from the council, so the intention is that in the first instance that's an officer meeting and we'd be able to then report back in due course, Chair. So really just for noting at this stage. Okay, can I have a proposal and a seconded mm -hmm. note? Marty and Russian. Okay, thank you. 13.3. Chair, 13.3, it's a notification from the Cabinet Office, and this is regarding the provision for a free portrait of His Majesty the King for public authorities. And there's a closing date for applications of Friday the 2nd of February of next year, so for members' consideration. Okay, John. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a, an important offer. It, it's uh, the Royal Family do mean a lot to quite a few people in, in this district, but also the Royal Family have been there to step across divides, to compromise and, and to seek reconciliation, no more so than in our own town here in Enniskillen where we saw the Queen go across from the cathedral into St. Michael's Church. So I would propose that we take the Cabinet Office up on this offer, and uh, it'll then be a discussion about where we put it, but I would like to see us get this portrait. Okay. And are you willing to note the correspondence, John? And Aaron? Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to Councillor McClory for his proposal. I think it is important that he's made some very relevant comments there with regard to the royal family and the way they have crossed all boundaries uh, within Northern Ireland, throughout the UK, and indeed the Republic of Ireland. And I, I will have pleasure in seconding his proposal and also the noting of the correspondence. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Seamus? Um, well, I would propose that we do not accept uh, this offer. Uh, and I would propose it because our policy is not to have uh, symbols and emblems and, and political uh, memorabilia uh, uh, in any of our civic buildings or that. So uh, I'm not sure what the purpose of uh, wasting the money of uh, bringing this portrait over here to just have it stored in some council building. So uh, I would, uh, especially in the, these times of uh, of the cost of living crisis and that, I don't think it would be we uh, very uh, well used money to be uh, bringing that over to uh, stored in a building. Okay. Thanks, Seamus. Diana? Thank you, yes. Um, indeed, I think it would be churlish of of uh, Sinn Féin not to support this because um, we all witnessed when King Charles came on his tour following his crowning, the very, very warm relationship he received from all parties. And I think as an outreach of that, um, it would be, I think it would be acceptable to receive the portrait. And indeed, I do believe that there's a portrait of the late Queen in the museum and that if, if it cannot be displayed here, that I think that would be a fitting venue for it also. So I would support the proposal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Senator. And Adam? 
Thank you, um, Chair. I, I would tend, we were thinking about this, and I tend to actually agree with uh, Councillor Green's interpretation of our policy that it is, it could, could definitely be seen as a political symbol. Some people wouldn't, and I understand that, see it as a political symbol, but many, many people would. And in addition to that, we've been having a discussion uh, since the start of this term regarding um, artwork that we have and photos that we have of our own history of the council area of Fermanagh and of Oma, and we don't have the space for them. So would we be removing our own local uh, portraits to make space for, for an additional one from, from elsewhere? Um, but I think, it, I think it potentially goes against our policy, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, Robert. Thanks very much, Chair Tom. Um, obviously, it'll be no surprise that I don't um, agree with the opinion of Councillor Green and Councillor Gallon. Um, I, I think it's wrong for Councillor Gallon to say that the monarchy should be perceived as political. Um, they, in actual fact, try their utmost not to be political. And I think, as my colleagues have said, they have crossed the divide with regard to trying to reach across the hand of both communities. I, I think there's an issue po possibly here of double standards, because this is supposed to be a shared island, and we are supposed to respect each other's cultures. We are actually trying to participate in our perceived culture and we would like to avail of the offer coming from the cabinet office. It's another thing where the portrait may or may not hang. That is a, a different discussion. The actual discussion at hand is whether we will uptake the offer. And I think it would be wrong for all parties not to accept it. It is not a political gesture. It is an apolitical gesture. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Tom. OK, thanks, Robert. So I have a proposal on the floor at the moment, proposed by John, seconded by Earl, that uh, we do accept the uh, portrait as offered. Uh, so I'm going to put that to a vote. So just set up that. It's your vote is live now. Oh, no. Say again. Did anybody second Seamus's proposal? No. Which way are you putting to vote then? Which way are you putting to vote? Yes. 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 Adam said he was supportive of Seamus's position. So uh, I've called the vote on uh, Victor. So. So can the look? Hmm? Can I still I still can get the look? No, once I've taken the vote down, thanks. I think I'm with losing this vote. Or is that the no? Oh no, that's the no, sorry, sorry, vote. Uh, no, that's so what's that? What's that? 21 12, is it? 22. Okay, Chair, so there were 12 votes for and 22 votes against, so that proposal fails. Okay, members. Moving on to 13. Okay, Chair, this is correspondence from Ards and North Downborough Council, and this is in relation to a motion uh, recently adopted by the Council, and really the relevant actions are, uh, or the suggested actions for our Councillor in the latter part of the letter um, includes making representations to our own MLAs and MPs, 
and it's all around the principles of lifelong learning. So recommending, Chair, that, that uh, we would note it. Um, certainly wouldn't recommend that if Ards and North Down are writing to the other councils, uh, we could probably just write back and confirm our support for the motion if members were so inclined. Okay, thanks, Alison. Have I got a proposal in Sancta? Barry, thank you. And Nolan, all agreed? Thank you. 13.5. Hey, yes, Chair, this is follow-up correspondence from the Chief Executive of the Western Trust regarding rheumatology uh, provision at Southwest Acute Hospital. There had been an earlier response in April from the Trust, and then this is the updated position, just confirming the uh, that the Trust has now secured a long-term locum appointment and that the planned weekly clinics were due to be reinstated as of August of this year. Okay. Some good news. So, can I have a proposal on saying there? Uh, Eddie, thank you. And, and Adam, thank you. Okay. Sorry, Chair. There's just then one other item of correspondence, uh, which is from, again, the National Association of Councillors. It's just in relation to their conference on the climate emergency sorry which is due to be held from the 12th to the 14th of january uh, 2024 in south shields tyne and weir um, and the details are provided there chair but the travel costs i uh, don't think actually the cost is on that it's typically in around 350 pounds and travel would be additional okay proposed a note by john seconded by paul all agreed Okay, nothing else in the other. No, that's it. Okay, we're going to move on to our notice of motion, and that's proposed by uh, Nolene and seconded by Seamus. So, uh, Nolene, floor is yours. Thank you, you Chair. Have five minutes in your proposal. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, this is about the closure of the Ulster Bank in Lisnesky next March. Uh, this closure of the last remaining physical bank in Lisnesky is a huge blow to the town and the surrounding areas. It leaves the whole of Ernest without a bank and also deprives the areas of Rossley, Dona, Newtown Butler, Brookborough and Maguire's Bridge of face-to-face -face banking, of which we are dependent on because of our rural nature. It also affects the staff members who now face uncertainty in their employment. The branch offered people access to cash, businesses access to a night safe, and one-to-one -one advice on accounts and finances. Again, we are seeing the disproportionate negative effect on rural areas like Ernest. Um, between May 2020 and January 2023, 52 bank branches have closed in the north, which is 27% of the total network. In a recent uh, Consumer Council research in 2022, they found that 59% of the rural population in the north live further than two kilometres from a physical bank branch. And just to put that into perspective for this area, someone from Rossley will have to travel 37.8 kilometres or 23.5 miles to the nearest branch in Enniskillen. That's a 75.6 kilometer or 47 mile round trip just to access a branch. Uh, Ulster Bank, along with others in the recent past, have always mentioned many people banking online and using their digital services, um, which is all fine. Unless your broadband is unreliable or not accessible, which happens frequently. Unless you're an older customer who may not be familiar or confident with digital devices or have the means to purchase them, or you're on a low income or are disabled, especially blind or partially sighted, who will really feel the effects of this closure and the loss of face-to-face -face service in a physical branch. Ulster Bank have said that they will offer support to all people who are worried about the closure including older, older and vulnerable customers, and will hold pop-ups in the local community for a period of 12 weeks after the closure. But these will all be cashless and more there to offer advice. 
So I would like to see more information on this in the coming months. Uh, finally, I'd just say I think inviting the Financial Services Union to speak to this council, who represent the staff of Ulster Bank, who are campaigning against these closures, I think this would be beneficial. They have knowledgeable information on the subject and the negative social effects on rural areas like ours. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. And Seamus. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would uh, like to second uh, this motion. Um, when I've seen uh, this uh, announcement being made, uh, it left me in total shock um, that the second biggest uh, town in our county has now been reduced from three banks in the last few years to no banks. I believe it's the only county of the 32 that this is, is the case, that the second largest town in the county has no banking facilities whatsoever. I think it's another case of just the contempt uh, that big business like bankers have for uh, rural Ireland and for the especially rural Fermanagh that this has happened. Uh, I don't think they'd get away with it in, in some of the other counties, but uh, again, we are seen as a, a, a soft touch. The figures that the bank give in their letters and emails out that 18 people per week were regularly using the bank, uh, I'm going to say it as a downright lay. I be in that in Lister Ski uh, every day of the week, and there is people coming and going from that, that bank uh, constantly. Any time ever I go into the bank, you have to stand and queue up at the counter. That, uh, that, and that's every single time, no matter what time of the day you go in, it's the same case. So, th so that figure is just downright disgraceful that they uh, put up there. Uh, the, they're saying there's a cash machine in the local spa shop. Well, the local spa shop doesn't be open 24 hours a day. So again, the second biggest town in our county uh, uh, will for at least or a near 12 hours of the day have no facility to get, uh, for anyone to get cash from. It's, it's actually the, uh, disgusting. And I, I'm afraid, again, our voice will be ignored. Uh, it has been ignored before and it will be ignored again. But all we can do is put up the best fight we can. But uh, these banks and these bankers don't care. Uh, they got bailed out by the ordinary people, and now they're just running with the cash, running for the hills, getting everyone online. And see when we all get online and somebody decides maybe to cut that big, big... Um, uh, wire that goes between Europe and America, uh, like the, the way that uh, North Stream was, was blew up. Uh, I wonder what way we will all be then without any, any facility to bank and run. Uh, but anyway, we'll leave it at that. It's just getting that ordinary people and people in rural areas that there's no broadband, no facilities uh, to, to go to. It's just, it's really is disgusting. And, but I, uh, I, uh, want to support this motion and I commend it to the to the chamber. Yeah, thanks, Seamus. Eddie? Thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you to the councillors who brought forward this motion. Uh, the Alliance Party will be supporting it. Uh, I think it's absolutely crazy to see uh, Lister Ski and the, the surrounding area, uh, which services a very large rural population, uh, to not have any bank whatsoever uh, within the vicinity. Um, we would hope that uh, the decision is changed. Um, in lieu of that, I have been working um, to try and get access to a banking hub, which I don't know if all countries are aware of, but uh, Link, who will operate ATM machines, have started producing uh, banking hubs across the UK. The, the first one was opened in Kilkeel, and four more have been announced across Northern Ireland. But uh, as people probably expect in this chamber, there's none in the Fermanagh area, um, and I would clearly see that Liston Ski has a higher priority than any of those four, uh, namely uh, Portrush, Newcastle, Warren Point, and uh, Cumber. Uh, 
Warren Point is 10 minutes from Uri. Uh, Cumber is eight minutes from uh, uh, Newton Arts, both of which have multiple banks, uh, whereas Listed Ski is, is if, if the traffic allows, uh, uh, just under 20 minutes from, from Miniskill. So uh, it's clear uh, that really the banking hub should be of a priority at Listed Ski ahead of at least two of those, if not all of them. Uh, I have spoken to Link, who uh, who will be kind of organising this. They have reviewed it after the, uh, the Ulster Bank was closed and have said that, that is not on the cards, uh, which I am going to be discussing with uh, them on Monday. And I hope I'll be able to bring that forward to the PNR committee uh, next week. Um, we believe that the Consumer Council of Northern Ireland uh, were the people who recommended the four banking hubs for those four particular towns and villages. And I will hopefully be able to, uh, with the council's assistance, uh, write to them to get their support for a banking hub in Lissiski. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Eddie. Gavin? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. And firstly, I would like to Thank Councillor Hayes and Councillor Green for bringing this very important motion for the Council tonight. Um, this decision taken by Ulster Bank to close these branches is nothing short of a disaster, and none more so than the Listen Ski branch, the last remaining bank in the town. Um, this decision to close is truly often used for the entire Listen Ski community and the wider Erin East area. The loss of the 21 jobs is another devastating consequences of this rash decision. I know my thoughts are very much with each and every employee affected by this, and I'm sure everyone here would agree with that. This to me is very much another attack on our rurality and our local services. These decisions taken by people in cities really don't see the bigger picture and the consequences of these vital decisions. Um, there are still so many of our people out there that really rely on our physical banks and face-to-face -face banking. In fact, in some cases, some would even enjoy the trips to town to go to visit the bank. Um, the move towards more online and digitalised banking, as the motion states, in my view, is a very worrying sign for our older generation and our less IT savvy people. I know the future very much looks that way, but as I said before, there are those that rely on the physical banks and I very much think that there's still a place for them in our society. I 100% agree that a presentation from the FSU is an excellent step forward in a campaign calling for the reversal of these decisions. And um, we, the SDLP, will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gavin. And I suppose just to add my piece there, um, not alone all of the things that people have mentioned is the outworkings of a closing of a bank, but when you look at the likes of Listen Ski that has two uh, bank buildings probably going to sit idle, and when you look at Newton Butler that closed the bank many years ago, and that bank is still lying as a derelict building. So not alone does it put people out of jobs, it creates then the derelict look about a place as well. So it's definitely a knock-on effect uh, for years to come. Uh, dear, dear Mr. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just to, you know, put it into context, uh, Ulster Bank is a multi-million corporation. It, its profits have never been better. Uh, you know, the advance of online banking has done wonders for the for the pockets of of the shareholders there. Uh, but very, very importantly, so has the loyalty of the customers over the years. You know, customers have have used their facilities you know, unwaveringly, uh, and this is how they're being treated. You know, I think it's just another example of, you know, a wealthy corporation throwing its customers under the bus just so they can increase the profits of the, the shareholders at the top. So the motion calls for engagement with the Financial Services Union. That absolutely should happen. They are the, the key people in all of this. They represent the workers. Um, and we need to get a handle on how to deal with the challenges brought on by digital banking, uh, especially for rural areas, like listen to ski in this case. Um, I think uh, I would be much more in favor of, of an ethical banking system, you know, where, where people are treated with respect and have an input 
into the kind of services that they can expect in their areas. So fully support the motion. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chairman. And Victor. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'm not going to go over everything that's already been said. It's hard to uh, agree with most of it. Um, we obviously, uh, I live between Brookburn and Fimeltown, and in the last um, in the last couple of years, we have lost our bank in Fimeltown and also the lost the Ulster Bank in Clutter Valley. So basically, we're 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 with no banks close to us at all. Um, in the, a lot of the Ernie area, as it's already been highlighted, this is the last remaining bank, bank and it was supposed to be the second largest town in Fermanagh. Um, I can remember a time when Mr. Ski had three banks, uh, and now uh, come March, they're going to have none. Obviously, we all are familiar with the fight that we had with the Bank of Ireland um, not that long ago, and we met with them and we spoke to them. But realistically, the decision has been made with the Ulster Bank and Listen to Ski, and I would be very surprised if we can turn that around because of obviously they're closing. I can't remember how many uh, branches it is in across Northern Ireland, but they're closing a number of branches. So I would say it's a case the decision has been made and it'll not be reversed. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Victor. Paul? Thank you, Chair. No, it's a complete disaster for. Erin East area. I mind the four banks in, in Erin East, one in Newtown and three in Listen Ski. Now there's not a bank left. There's not a bank in Pyman Town. There's not a bank in Clogger. And there's not even there's banks away in Ballygully as well. So Loch Nacloy is gone too. So when you want to go down through all them wee towns, there's nothing there. There's a big effect on businesses in Listen Ski alone because a lot of people go to the bank, get a few pounds before they go to the the shops, and it's going to be, is the ATM machine going as well, isn't it? I think it is. So we need to look for a good ATM machine to remain on the street 24 hours a day, 24 hours. So, and I suppose DUP will be supporting the motion. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Josephine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, this is a very important motion, and I support it unequivocally uh, in all its parts and uh, commend Councillor Hayes and Councillor Green for bringing it forward. Uh, it's an extremely disappointing and concerning development that the Ulster Bank would decide to close 10 of its local branches, including the branch in this Niski. Chair, I'm old enough to remember, like other members, when many of our small towns uh, had multiple banks uh, in, 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 in villages and towns, and in fact, it was considered to be a sign of the prosperity and the status of the town. And in fact, um, uh, when I was at school, um, people considered uh, a career in banking to be very much coveted. And many people did very well in their careers in banking. Uh, unfortunately, it looks as though with the loss of 21 jobs locally, and wider uh, uh, in the north that there are going to be very considerable job losses and i think uh, that this will deter able people uh, from going into uh, that profession the fact of the matter is that particularly in these times of financial pressures and constraints quite often people will require um, advice from their local bank manager and in fact, years ago, the bank manager uh, was a very valued member of the community, offering advice and support to private individuals and to businesses. And it is a shame uh, that this is not going to happen in Lisnesky. Unfortunately, this is a trend that we are seeing more and more. And uh, it just seems to be the shape uh, of what is coming down the line. So I think that as a, as a public body, it is right and proper that we should express our opposition to this because I think it detracts from our rural way of life and the valuable services that these banks provide. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm happy to support this motion, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Josephine. All right. Uh, Chair, just two points. Um, this contributes to an added problem. 
of businesses, uh, organisations, charity organisations, having to transport money long distances. Um, a couple of organisations have mentioned that to me, that they're faced with long treks with cash very often. So it's a, a, it's a negative. There's another negative. And secondly, just since it's annual general meeting time of year with many of our local credit unions, I just want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the credit union movement and all of our areas across Tyrone and Fermanagh, uh, the excellent work they do at community level. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Barry. Okay, I'm not seeing any other speakers, so Nolene, you have an opportunity. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for everybody that has spoken and supporting this motion for your contributions. Um, I think everything's been said. I think it's devastating. I think it is another, another loss to our rural communities. And if we, we may not be able to stop the closure, um, but we, I think it's very important that we keep fighting to stop this um, discrimination against rural communities and all the vulnerable um, individual communities within that rural community. Um, and obviously, I think inviting the FSU will give us some very knowledgeable information on this to help that fight against discrimination, hopefully. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Tony. Now, members, the, the motion has been duly put and seconded and spoken on. Can I take it that we are all in agreement? OK, thank you, members. That concludes the motion. I'm moving on to any other urgent and relevant business. At this point, I'm going to take uh, Victor. Thank you, Chair. Well, basically, all I want to do is um, propose that uh, Councillor Armstrong is now uh, our representative on the audit committee. Thank you. Does that need to be no, that's good. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Victor. And I don't believe there was anybody else. No. Okay, now I'm going to look for a proposal and second to go into committee. So, John and uh, Portugin, thank you. And will you get a little indication when we're in committee? So, the recording is.
Yeah, we're, we're back on. So can I ask Alison just to sum up what happened? Okay, Chair, thank you. While in committee, the Council confirmed and signed the confidential minutes of the Council meeting held on the 7th of November and received an update matter arising in relation to a number of legal cases. Considered the confidential report of the Environmental Services Committee meeting held on the 8th of November and adopted the minutes. There were no matters arising from that meeting. Uh, considered an update on the confidential report of the Regeneration and Community Committee meeting held on the 14th of November and adopted the minutes. There were no matters arising and received a confidential update of the Policy and Resources Committee meeting held on the 15th of November, formally adopted the meeting and uh, agreed a recommendation in relation to administrative matters. Okay. I have a proposed Josephine, thank you, and seconded Adam, thank you. Okay, members, all agreed. Okay, that brings us to a close, members, and just as chair, on behalf of us all, wish you a very happy and peaceful Christmas and a relaxing uh, New Year as you come back uh, ready and willing uh, in the beginning of January. So, and hungry. Okay, good night, guys, and safe home.